to you from Zoomlandia with a special guest, Kate Atherley. And Kate came to my attention earlier this year when I was reading an article that she wrote for the New York Times. And then she even taught at our Knit and Escape virtual retreat. So I'm really excited to chat with you today. Yeah, very excited to be here, Christy. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. I see that your hair is getting a little longer. It's a little wacky. And what's <laughs> happening, I try and comb it, but it's so thick and wavy and, um, do I comb it and make it look weird or do I leave it uncombed and make it look weird? So I've just, I'm, I'm just letting it be what it wants to be. My hair is a free spirit. Way. Yes. If I, if I take a brush to it, I'm like, yeah. what, what happened? What's yeah, that? exactly. It's not quite long enough though. I'm quite jealous of yours because I'd like to be able to pull it back and it's not quite long enough. And if I may confess, I took my sewing scissors to my bangs yesterday in desperation, yes. and I don't know that I made it any better at all. <laughs> there should be a whole series of our a per pandemic hair, right? Yeah, there really should. There it's really should. Yeah. So yeah, I just, I let it be what it wants to be. <laughs> well, I would love for you to start by telling us your fiber story. How did you get into this career of knitting? Well, I, I've been a knitter pretty much my entire life. I, I've knitted for so long, I actually don't remember learning i i was um i'm from the uk and my beloved grandmother was a lifelong knitter and i used to spend a lot of time with her and she was always knitting she also crocheted and i would spend tons of time with her and i think it just got passed on by osmosis mm -hmm. i remember sitting beside her sitting at her feet uh, and she would be knitting and i would be playing with yarn and needles and it just it's it just happened and i can remember even when i was very young i would knit little doll blankets and things the crochet didn't take mm. as a kid all i managed to do was very long crochet chains which i would wear as a belt okay. which you know and I'm honestly I would run around the house with them I'm surprised that the cat didn't trip over them um but yeah so lifelong knitter and I well as I was a teenager it's not I don't think it's really a sport necessarily for teenagers because you know there's other things it, it takes a little bit of patience that I didn't have at that age but mm. once I finished university and I had some spare time on my hands I came back to it uh, I happened to move to Toronto at that time and I lived around the corner from one of the largest yarn stores in the city at the time which is wonderfully still open a store called Romney Walls and so it just it was fate I think I came wandered in on a Saturday afternoon and here I am <laughs> Did you study anything near knitting in university? No, I have a degree in theoretical mathematics of all things. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved when I was a teenager, I didn't I didn't knit so much, but I did love sewing. I made a lot of my clothes. And uh, ultimately, once I so started to dip into this, I did go and s do some studying of fashion at George Brown College here in Toronto. It's a very well respected college for fashion. And so I did some studying there as well. But no, my degree is all about the mathematics, which uh, <laughs> is surprisingly useful in this. This, I will say surprisingly I was, useful. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't think it's a surprise. I feel like math happens so much in knitting, especially when you want to change something out. And I was actually just visiting one of your articles on yarn substitution. Yes. And I love the way she writes. You have to check out how she writes, uh, at least with this article, she would put dearest designer and then <laughs> this caution and then dearest knitter yeah. so you feel this sense of sense of warmth and safety and then you kind of get a little a little mini smackdown on there oh yeah no absolutely that. i'm, I'm a little, i can be a little bossy it's true i and i say that in my classes that i've been teaching knitting professionally now for goodness just about 20 years i think or going on and I, I sort of live in two worlds because as a technical editor and a book editor and a patent editor, I speak to designers and I work with designers, but because I also teach and I speak to knitters, I see both sides of it. And the longer I've been teaching, the more frustrated I get with patterns that aren't helpful. Is that a polite yes. way of putting it? Yes. Because I see so many knitters get frustrated and I see so many knitters 
not have a good time and ultimately we want them to love the craft like speaking as a designer as an industry person I want the knitter to love the craft Mm -hmm. I want the knitter to love the process I want the knitter to love the result and be able to wear proudly what they've made and I get a little bit frustrated and I'm getting more you know a little bit grumpier I think every year with a pattern that isn't as helpful and that you know doesn't set a knitter up uh, up for success because I I just want I want people to love knitting love what they make and keep knitting Mm -hmm. so you are passionate about what the most like the knitting the teaching the editing or is it all the same to you can you separate them out like where does your passion lie oof I think they go together together they feed into each other so much and I think if I did one to the exclusion of the other it would lose a lot of what the joy is for me because I love spending time with knitters and because it informs how I design it informs how I write patterns and it informs how I edit for me I the kind of designing I do is often so associated with teaching skill building I like to design things that teach people a new skill or that lets them explore a skill Mm -hmm. and I think that if I didn't have that connection to knitters I wouldn't have those fun challenges. Like I love a de- I love a challenge of let's design something that, uh, for example, brioche is an example that comes along. Let's design something that teaches brioche or that lets people dig into that skill. And when I'm editing, it's important to me to say to be able to represent the knitter position as well and say to a designer, you know what? Let's clarify that because that might be a stitch or that might be an abbreviation a knitter may not have encountered before. That kind of thing. So. They're all important and I enjoy, I also enjoy being able to do lots of different things and articulate kind of our craft in different ways. Some of them mathematical and some of them just about what's on my, what's on my needles, you know. Would you like to talk about some of your publications? I know Absolutely. You, yeah, you just mentioned sort of giving knitters the tools and, and I was just thinking about how you have a custom fit hat, you have custom shawls. So are there any publications in particular you'd like to m- mention? I have four books in a series. I have, so I have a custom fit socks book, uh, a book called Knit Mitts. I have custom shawls and then I have custom fit hats. And these are all about enabling knitters to make something for themselves that meets their desires and requirements. And Mm -hmm. I I like to joke that the professional start part of my knitting career started because I have small feet. (laughs) <laughs> and the sock book that I bought, I decided I was going to learn to knit socks because, because my grandmother was a sock knitter. And right, that's it. I'm going to learn to knit socks. And the sock the book that I bought, they were all beautiful, but they, all kept, they were all in one size, which at the time didn't occur to me, may or may not be a good thing. <laughs> and so I started, I started kind of fixing and tweaking the sock to fit me. And then I realized other people might want to be able to do that too. And so... I've published a number of books, but these four really are represent uh, my thinking about how a knitter can be empowered to grab any skein of yarn and grab any person, feet, hat, and just make something that really works for them. Because that's a big part of the joy in this is making something that is what you want to make. This is our creative impulse. And so it should look the way you want it to fit and obviously the shawl book is more about how things look than it is about how things fit and that is one of the great joys of shawl knitting we don't have to worry so much about fit um but with socks and mittens and hats let's make sure that they fit right and also use up the yarn you want to use you shouldn't have to use the yarn that somebody else used use the yarn you want to use yeah you talked about that a lot in the yarn substitution article uh just pointing out that There are all kinds of reasons why a designer uses a specific yarn from partnering with a company to having it in their stash to whatever it is. So I love that you pointed that out. Now I was looking at some of your patterns for sale and I don't know how many you have for sale, but I wanted to talk about the Dr. Tam's shawl specifically. And the reason this came up for me, I, I, I ended up reading the entire sort of, I would call this a little mini article about it. And because my daughter had a surgery during coronavirus by a Dr. Tam. And so I wondered if it was the same one, but no, it isn't. And so it it immediately struck a chord with me. And then turns out this is your response to COVID-19 as well. So yes, 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah. So this show, I, I have a good friend. In fact, she, my co, uh, co-author on the Custom Shows book is a yarn dyer as well. Uh, her company is Indigo Dragonfly. And she has a, a wickedly wonderful sense of humor. Uh, and she and I enjoy joking a, a lot about things. And I think humor in sometimes is how we cope. And uh, it, in the early days of COVID, there was a picture going around on social media of the virus yes. and the colors it was a really striking photograph because the colors the gray and the red and the orange and the black and I mean you can see how I'm dressed today those are they're my palette they're colors I absolutely adore and I joked to her that I oh this would make a really good colorway for yarn and and she dyed it for me, which is brilliant. And um, so I designed a shawl. I had to design a shawl using this yarn. And what I did, there's a stitch pattern, an old lace stitch pattern called drops and droplets. And I just kind of riffed on that. And I used exponent. This is my degree in mathematics coming together with my wicked sense of humor. Uh, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to drop some pictures in so that people can see the shawl. I just, I grew the lace motif so it gets bigger and bigger. So it's you know, a, a little, a little joke, if you will, in knitting, which turns out to be a shawl that I really adore uh, using that colorway. So it's perhaps maybe being, maybe being a little bit edgy. And I hope nobody thinks that I'm poking fun because obviously this is something very serious and this is something very difficult um, that we're going through together. And it's something that is deeply unpleasant, but I was having fun with uh, a little bit of a mathematical principle and a photograph in colors I adore. So, <laughs> and Dr. Tam is someone here, uh, the chief medical officer of health in Canada here, and she's been doing incredible work in terms of communication around COVID strategies and around keeping us safe. So I felt that it was appropriate to honor her with uh, naming the shawl after her. Yeah, I love that. I know that we all have our medical heroes during this time. And yeah. I agree. I think that we all understand what a serious and unprecedented time this is, but we're all coping in different ways. And I think it's really cool that you that you design that. Just there's always all these stories in your patterns. So the find your feet, blood on the tracks. <laughs> yeah, so, that's that same yarn dyer. She enables my wicked sense of humor. It yes. Stops you in your tracks and you go, wait a second, what? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. You're going to make me seem very flippant. Well, maybe I am kind of. No, well, no. So it's right that, on your website. <laughs> it is. It's true. It's true. So yeah, that one I um. Uh, so um Bob Dylan album and uh and then I uh we have a co house cocktail which uses the San Pellegrino blood orange soda which yes. is if you haven't had it it's delicious <laughs> and I like that flavor because it's a little bit tart mm -hmm. and it's such a gorgeous orange color I think I'm sure you're the same way I will sometimes choose a food or a drink or something based on the color and when okay. I saw the color of this because it is it's an incredible shade of red orange it's beautiful so I bought this and it turns out to be excellent in the summer mixed with a little bit of bourbon if that's your thing if you like a cocktail and so that's sort of our house cocktail and we call it blood on the tracks because it's blood orange and it's anyway yeah uh and so again this wicked yarn wicked sense of humor yarn dyer friend of mine dyed me a colorway to match and so i designed a pair of socks to go with it as well and i call it find your feet uh because it's a good i use it sometimes as a teaching pattern for teaching sock knitting because mm -hmm. it's got a lot of the things that i use in my fundamental sock patterns in terms of the my favorite heel turn and my favorite type of toe so yes there's my cheeky pattern naming you also have Women of Mathematics Laceway Collection. Very dignified. Yes. Thank you. See, much, much better, much more <laughs> dignified, much more tasteful, I think. Yes. I yeah. love I love the moto jacket. She has a knitted moto jacket, you guys. Yeah. Complete yeah. with zipper. And what would you call these? Uh, accoutrement on the side like snap snappy things yeah sort of snappy button things yes <laughs> that's the technical term I think they're not quite the snaps that we see on a moto jacket they come from a company called jewel closures and they're absolutely amazing they're these screw in uh, accoutrements that you can put on your knits and yeah that was that was a fun project and that I don't publish a ton of garment designs for me uh I I will 
in that case, it was something that I desperately wanted to knit. I knitted it for myself, but the response to it was so good, so good. I designed a pattern for it. And it's a, it's a project because you do have to insert not one, but three zippers because you've got the garment zipper and then you've got the sleeve zippers as well. Someone just asked why I didn't put zippered pockets in. And I said, honestly, I think asking anybody to put five, five zippers into a garment would probably be a bridge too far but uh, yeah no I had a lot of fun with that so my mum would never let me have a motorcycle jacket when I was a teenager I so desperately wanted one mm -hmm. and then for a while I couldn't afford one because the good ones they're not inexpensive right a good leather jacket and so I just yeah, I can knit myself one <laughs> so let's talk about a little bit more about your grandma your mom and your tradition of growing up in the UK Talk about the fiber industry there, because I've I've had some really great stories recently of women who are a bit older than you, but they have like this one woman was talking about how she would save her lunch money and then go to her local yarn shop and get a skein at a time. Oh. And I, I don't think that's the era in which you were growing up, but just talk a little bit about that and, and how it's influenced your career. Well, I think it, I think it might be a little bit different in North America as it is in the UK, my experience. And I'm, I'm generalizing here based on my own experience but I think that maybe in North America knitting dwindled dwindled sooner than it did in the UK maybe I think in the UK we had more of a connection to it for longer and so you know I think there were and I'm cautious here too because I don't want to indulge in any stereotypes. So when I say granny, I mean I mean that lovingly. But you know, the grannies were knitting. There were a lot more grannies making beautiful craft for their families and for their grandchildren into the 80s and 90s. Whereas I think in North America, it had maybe was, had, was less popular at that time. And so what happened in North America? I think we see there's a bit more of a generational gap. So there's a lot of knitters in North America who fondly remember maybe their grandmother's knitting but maybe not so much their mums so there was a bit it wasn't perhaps passed on in the same way my mum my grandmother was an excellent excellent knitter and crocheter my mum is a great knitter and crocheter as well what I see is something interesting though for many of these crafts we see a generation being skipped because my grandmother knitted because she had to because she she was making clothes for her family and then my mom she's really good at it but she doesn't love it in the same way for her I think she connected it too much with something that her mom had to do there was an element of maybe housework or chore about it and so although there's a generation that are really skilled they don't love it they don't see it as a creative outlook but the granddaughters don't have the housework connotation to it. I hope I'm not explaining this this badly, but they don't have the house housework connotation to it. So the granddaughters, I again, I fondly remember sitting at my grandmother's lap and I can enjoy it just as a creative outlet. And the granddaughters are seeing it that way without the necess that without the connection of it being a necessity. I think you're absolutely right. I, my great grandmother and her mother were definitely crocheting knitting out of necessity. In fact, I have, I don't know if you can see it. Do you see that giraffe? That oh, yes, giraffe I can. Yes. Is wearing a bonnet that was for my great grandmother who was born in 1900. Oh, that's so incredible. That bonnet must have been made by my great great grandmother yes. or yep. another relative yep. out of necessity yep. because of baby the bonnet. And then her, her children, that baby's children, or yeah. sorry, that baby's child, I never saw her once yeah. with yarn in her hands. So that's my grandma. Yeah. And so, and my mom does it, but she's sort of picked it up a little bit in later years. So I think yeah. it is really fascinating, the generation skip. And of course, you know, my grandma probably loved her, her own father had a ready to wear store. So imagine uh, yes. how she was raised. Yep. Yeah ready to wear you walk in you buy you have the best fashion in town or whatever you know the vibe that would have been a delight yeah but you can see why she wasn't hand yeah. anything yes so it's very cool and that was so she was born in probably 1923 or something so yeah. here we go I think that your explanation is right on yeah and it's interesting and I love that we're able to just just 
come back to these wonderful, wonderful crafts. And we're seeing it in all kinds of crafts as well. I mean, obviously there's yarn crafts, we're seeing it in sewing. I mean, even things like jam making and things. And I, I you know, just being able to come back to that. And, you know, I'm learning to make bread. I, I, I've been late to the sourdough thing, but I finally, finally got it. And, you know, to some extent, the, the being at home through lockdown has helped, helped a little bit, helped people understand the joy of the craft and the joy of making. I was just going to say, you did mention sourdough in your article. Yes, yes. <laughs> for the New York Times. So what were you covering in that article in case people haven't seen well, it? Well, what I wrote about for the Times was really just people coming to knitting and it might be coming back to knitting or coming to knitting and using craft as a way to soothe, using craft as a way to distract using craft as a way to step away from our work because especially when we're working from home and when there's not a lot of distractions available to us in the outside world it's really hard to build that barrier between your personal life and your work life and if your laptop is on your kitchen table the risk is that you're working all of the time and yes of course we've got Netflix and we've got our other distractions what knitting does for a lot of people is it gives you something to focus on that's not your work. And if you're knitting, you can't be checking your email. <laughs> you can't be responding to tweets. You can't be uh, you can't be focused on that kind of thing. So it takes you out of the things that we're focused on. And you know, the internet, the online world can be a little bit stressful, whether it's just through your work being busy or just focusing on the news and all of that. And so being able to step outside of that world and focus on the satisfaction of making with our hands. And so much of what we do is virtual. So much of what we do is sending emails and talking to people. And although this feels less virtual because we can see each other and that's a, there's a joy in that, it's still not concrete. And the joy of being able to put your hands on something and feel something, the tactile pleasure, and the joy, frankly, of being able to make something, to have a finished project is, it's really wonderful. It re I, and I find it's immensely satisfying and it's people, and I'm going to use the word again, it's soothing for people. So the New York Times article I wrote was precisely about that, the value of that. And there are some knitters I know who are less focused on the end result. Uh, a process knitter and that's okay too for some people it may just be they want something to do with their hands as a distraction I know people who have taken up knitting as a way to help them quit smoking so they're not their hands are engaged elsewhere some people use it as a way to keep their hand out of the popcorn bowl and uh, for some people it is a rhythmic motion it is a meditative rhythmic motion so in addition to having really great socks and mittens and sweaters and scarves and shawls and home decor items it, there can also be simply value in it in how it grounds you and how it makes you feel it was an excellent article so i will try to link to that underneath thank you. Video. thank you let's talk about what you're wearing and what's on the dress form behind you because people will want to know absolutely so what i'm wearing now this is not one of my designs uh but this is uh sort of part of my custom fit ethos as well so this is a design from a designer called amy herzog and it's a cardigan called morbillo and i wear it all the time and to the point where I really probably should be wearing something I designed but it's just it's my favorite cardigan because that orange is I love it to pieces and it just it's so comfy it's so comfy it's great and it's just my favorite shade and behind me I love citrus colors can you tell you have a palette and I have a palette mm -hmm. behind me this is a shawl called Hollerith which is in my custom shawl box and what I did with this is I wanted to break some of the rules about what we thought about shawl knitting because we tend to think of shawls as often very delicate very elegant pieces very fine work and what I did here was I took not only a potentially a startling color that fantastically bright you will never ever get lost on a on a dark night wearing that shawl but I, so i wanted to uh, mess with expectations in terms of the color 
and we all wear dark winter coats right ever certainly in toronto we've all our winter coats are all navy and charcoal and black and chocolate brown so let's add some color to our winter outfits but also i wanted to play with expectations because the stitch patterning is so like that is so classically lace but in a ridiculous color and a fantastically ridiculous thickness of yarn yeah and and i i absolutely adore it it's my personal blanket and it's big and it's chunky and it takes basically no time to knit Love that. which is another benefit and i love encouraging people and this is part of making things the way you want them to be break the rules there's no who says lace has to be fine and delicate right i love a chunky shawl i love it yeah me too and right behind it i see your outlander book so yes what, what was your role on the outlander oh oh it was so wonderful so i was very lucky to be hired as the editor for the outlander book and i uh, i love the series i absolutely love the series and there was so much great knitting in it and i was hired as the editor for the outlander book and it, what a great experience because i was able to work with 20 designers uh to come up with things they came up with things and some of the designs in the book are you know clearly homages to stuff we see on the screen there's you know there's the capelet and there's the cow you'll know what i mean if you're a fan right there's the capelet and there's the cowl mm -hmm. and there's fingerless mittens that we see mrs fitz wearing you know but there's also things in the book that are inspired by the spirit of the series one of my favorite projects is a tea cozy because reading the tea leaves is really important and so although we don't see a tea co hand knit tea cozy specifically on on screen there's a tea cozy and it uses a an oak leaf motif which is uh, of a significant symbol to the uh jacobean rebellion so it connects into the series in the nice little way and i'm all about for me i'm all about being able to show my fandom for things in ways both direct and indirect i like those secret badges of those secret fandoms where oh that's a that's a nod to outlander without necessarily saying this is an outlander thing and i like the cleverness and i it was a joy to work with designers on that one and so yeah we have things we see on screen uh frank's vest by the way so if you're a fan there's a vest that everybody went just got so excited about i got really excited about a fair isle vest but it's it's not it's only really glimpsed on screen. It's not really in, in any scene for any great length of time, but it's such a beautiful classic Fair Isle design. And so we, I had a designer uh, come up with an interpretation of that, which, which I love. And it was just absolutely a joy. Designers from all over the world, including a, uh, a woman who lives in Scotland who is married to a real life Fraser. So I had to include her design. Definitely, definitely. So let's talk about your teaching and how has it shifted from the before times to the now times? <laughs> um, so in the before times, I had a fair number of classes on my list, which I think were in some ways frustrating for yarn stores because they were, if I say, if I describe them as theory classes, it makes them sound a bit scary, mm. but they were classes that were, had a PowerPoint presentation and would require a projector because I like to explain, for example, the mathematics behind sock construction. Mm. I like to explain how a garment construction works. Mm -hmm. And these are things that are not necessarily knitting classes, but they're talking about knitting and deepening people's understanding. So I have all these PowerPoint classes that were great in in at conferences and events but not necessarily good in stores and they're they translated so incredibly well to the now times to the yeah. zoom time so it's great I, I it's like there's a load of classes i didn't get to teach nearly often enough before i can teach a ton now and i'm i love teaching those classes help people understand how a sock is constructed or how a mitten is constructed or understand garment structure these things i absolutely adore them i've also got really good at doing demos and i'm hoping you can see this i'm going to show you my incredibly sophisticated camera setup so it's wow. duct tape to a can of lentils i'm giving my secrets away and in fact it sits on a can of soup ah. Uh, we have these sophisticated, sophisticated setups. So I'm getting better at doing the demo classes. There are a few things that they're still pretty hard to teach virtually because I just want to be able to get in there and say, no, 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 put your needle at this angle. <laughs> 
Um, let's say there's a few classes that I'm missing teaching very much right now that I think will come back once I'm back in person with people. But yeah, I, it's really allowing me to get, get nerdy, talking about yarn substitution, talking about math, talking about the technical details of knitting and the technical details of the hows, not just the whys. So talk to us about Nitty.com because aren't you uh, kind of in charge over there? Well, I'm in charge of the technical side of Nitty.com. So <laughs> Nitty.com, I'm very bossy. Nitty.com is an online knitting magazine that has been running for goodness, probably nearly 20 years now. And yeah, well, it was and right? I'm thrilled to continue to be associated with it. And what's great about Nitty, so it's a free online knitting magazine we publish four times a year uh with little mini surprise issues in between so there's you know there's new stuff from us you'll see new stuff from us about seven or eight times a year and there's always patterns and there's always additional articles about spinning we have a regular column about spinning we have technique and tutorial articles uh, i'm learning to do some videos i'm learning a ton about lighting for videos and uh, on and so it's it's about encouraging and teaching new knitters and we also like to encourage and teach new designers as well we do pay for our contributions uh, our patterns are available all for free and you know we love at nitty getting newer designers submitting and helping them build their audience and helping them get their name out into the world and we do have great solid established designers contributing as well but as sort of the the, the technical boss so the, the managing technical editor there's three technical editors we review the patents make sure they're solid make sure they're right make sure they're ready for uh, ready for publication we also work with newer designers to coach them on pattern writing and getting getting their stuff in a format that other knitters can knit from. So I sometimes work with designers to help them develop sizing and that kind of thing as well. And that's a real joy for me because I want I want, you know, it's, I want to encourage knitters, but I also want to encourage designers too. Yeah, I really get that. And that kind of brings us back full circle to where we started with the dearest designer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> moment is there anything else you'd like to share that i haven't asked you about today? oh goodness uh well there is a project that i've started up here in canada because as i am uh you know uh limited in my travel at the moment uh the border between canada and the us is closed and probably will be for a while yet uh i would normally be doing a fair bit of travel both in the uk and in the us for teaching so i've still got some canadian teaching and i'm doing a lot through zoom uh but what I discovered was that I wasn't spending enough time focusing on what was going on here at home. And, you know, when you're in other countries, you learn about what's going on in other countries. But I do live in, I'm an immigrant to Canada, but I've lived here for quite some time. And there's so much great fiber and textile arts going on in Canada. So I partnered up with a colleague who is also interestingly an immigrant to Canada. And we've launched an online magazine called Digits and Threads. And Digits and Threads is all about Canadian fiber and textile arts. So digitsandthreads.ca because we're proudly Canadian. And what we're doing is we're highlighting what's happening up here in we lovingly say in the Great White North. Uh, well, we do mean that very lovingly because uh, again we're both immigrants it's okay and um we're because there are so many wonderful artists doing so many wonderful things so it's broad it's not just knitting uh but we're profiling artists we're profiling uh projects uh we're profiling all sorts of great things that are got canadian interesting canadian craft traditions for example uh we've been doing some uh, profiles of indigenous beadwork which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And I learned about a particular type of weaving called Sainture Fleche, which is a, an arrowhead weaving, which is particular to Quebec. And it's used a lot for belts and sashes and things and learning about all of this stuff. So I've been enjoying, although I'm not spending so much time in airport lounges, what I am doing is spending time learning about all of the wonderful stuff that's uh, that's going on here at home. And that's been fantastic for me. So 
I'm just looking at digitsandthreads.ca right now, and I think that these articles are really interesting, especially all the textile museum features. Yes, yes. We have a marvelous textile museum here in Toronto called the Textile Museum of Canada. And what we've been able to do is uh, bring some of their exhibitions, help them bring some, uh, some of their exhibitions online. So there was an exhibition of printed textiles from an Indigenous uh, artist community in Northern Canada from the 60s and 70s and we brought some information on about that and had an Indigenous writer write about the work. Uh, we also worked with another gallery here in uh, Toronto to put online an exhibition that <laughs> they were ready to launch and we had another lockdown. So we have a video tour and some photographs of an exhibition of some amazing work, an artist who does hand embroidery at a large scale, combining vintage military blankets with vintage domestic textiles like doilies and pillowcases and crochet lace edgings and things. And it's been a joy for us to work with these groups to put this art online so it can be seen because of lockdown, but also it can be seen across Canada and across the world, you know, so, so smaller exhibitions. That's been an exciting thing for us to do. I get to see these exhibitions and I wouldn't normally have been able to, and then other people get to see them as well. I also see many articles here on size inclusion. So yes. The passion of yours as well. Yeah, we've done we've done some work and we're publishing articles about inclusivity. We published a series of articles and some guides about accessibility and patent inst written instructions and patents for craft. Uh, even just something as simple as showing how charts and things can be seen based on whether you've got color different types of color blindness or not. So that's actually been helpful to me personally, just understanding a little bit about a use of screen readers and things in for, for crafters. And then most recently we published a series of articles about uh, addressing size inclusivity and addressing the wide range of crafters out there who you know the wide range of body shapes and sizes because that we think that's really important too. And there's a, an author here in Canada Coincident, and I promise this is a coincidence, and she was my co-author on the custom shawl books, she, uh, Kim McBride Evans. She's doing a ton of um, a ton of work in size inclusivity and garment garment sizing. Now, do you have to be a member to see all of the content at Digits and Threads? So it, it, we are a membership site. Uh, some of the content is available to free members. Uh, and we have two tiers of paid membership. And uh, our armchair members see all of the articles. And then our studio members, which is a slightly higher tier, get access to all of the patterns. And we do monthly gatherings we call studio hours, where we have demos and guest lectures and tutorials. Last week, we did a, uh, we did a natural dyeing demo from my business partner's kitchen which was so much fun with uh with um goldenrod from her own garden that she had uh, dried which was very cool but we are we are asking our premium members to pay for their subscription so that we can pay our contributors so all contributions are paid and that's pretty important to us because we want to value the work of the artist and we want to value the work of of the crafters so that's important to us Love it. Well, I'm going to link to all of that underneath this video. I have Thank so much you. chatting with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for letting me uh, letting me go on about all of this. But it's been a joy to chat with you. And thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I uh, hopefully one day when I can cross the border, I will be able to meet you in person. But until then, I hope that we are able to encounter each other online again. And perhaps I'll see you at some classes. I look forward to that. And for now, we'll say goodbye. Thank you so much.